really happy to have Josh Owen here with us today. Uh, Josh did his, he started his PhD at Stanford and then he finished at MIT under co-advised by both Ryan and Virginia Williams. Uh, he's currently the Rabin postdoc in TCS at Harvard. Um, he won the best student paper at Fox 2019 and at CCC 2019. And in his free time, he's authored quite a few puzzles for Puzzle Hunts. And so he's going to talk to us today about turnstile streaming algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so this is joint work with Hua Cheng Yu, who's at Princeton. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to tell you about a faster uptight time for turnstile streaming algorithms. Uh, so first of all, what is turnstile streaming? Uh, so this is, a, this is like a data structure model, where you want to design a data structure to maintain a vector of n integers. And the types of updates you want to support are that uh, you'll get a pair of an i, which is an entry of the vector, and a delta, which is some integer. It could be positive or negative. And that means you're supposed to change the ith entry of your vector by adding delta to it. So these are the kinds of updates you want to support. And then, uh, and yeah, so we usually assume that throughout the sequence of updates, uh, each entry of the vector is like bounded in magnitude by at most a polynomial on n, so like all the entries fit into log n base. Okay. Uh, so, Typically, the goal in turnstile streaming is to try to use very little time and space while still being able to answer interesting queries about the vector you're, you're implicitly maintaining. So for some types of examples of queries you might want to answer, uh, maybe you want to estimate some norm of the vector, like the L2 norm. Or maybe you want to be able to answer point queries, like given an index i, uh, estimate the i entry of the vector. Or maybe you want to find heavy hitters. You want to find all the entries of the vector that are large compared to the rest of the entries of the vector. So these are some examples of queries you might want to try to answer. And uh, so our goal, we're usually going to want to be using like very sublinear space and time. So you can't hope to answer these queries exactly. So the goal is to be able to give good approximations to these queries with low failure probability, like one in poly n failure probability. Uh, and for example, it turns out that for these examples I wrote here, uh, you can solve all of them using just order log n space and update time in the RAM model. Okay, so there's, there's really nice efficient ways to, to answer these types of queries. So, uh, so here we're dealing with like these log run times in space, and so the, the, the model of computation we're working with is really important. So let me tell you a little bit more about the RAM model. Uh -huh. Sorry, perhaps you'll get to that, but like you're using log n space to hold n log n size numbers? Yeah, so it's log, it's, yeah, you, you don't store the whole vector. Okay, so you, the you point is store, you don't store even yeah. the whole vector. Yeah, you, you only store a little bit of information it's about not, the vector. It's, not, it's more than a data structure, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's, you, yeah, you don't, you don't store the whole vector, you just store like a sketch of the vector. Okay, so in the, in the RAM model, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll use the word RAM model with word size w, which is like order log n. Uh, so this is kind of the standard model people use in these streaming kinds of settings. Uh, so in this model, the algorithm has random access to words of memory, which you store w words. And what you usually assume is that standard word operations on constant number of words can be performed in a constant amount of time. Uh, so obviously the power of the model changes, depending on what you say is a standard operation, but we'll say things like ar arithmetic operations, like plus and times, and also bit operations, like bit shifts and bitwise ands and stuff. Those, those are the ones we'll call the standard operations. And this is, this is defined to sort of model how, you know, real world computers work, because in your computer, if you're adding two numbers, that, that's supposed to be a lot faster than doing more complicated things with two numbers. Uh, and this is the model that people usually study streaming algorithms like this in. Okay, so, let me give you two examples now of turnstile streaming algorithms. And these are examples that I would guess many of you have seen before, but I'm going to tell you about them anyway. So the first is the count min sketch. So with the count min sketch, uh, I'm going to use it to answer point queries. So we'll maintain a vector of n integers. Um, and let's say for now we only have incremental updates. So the deltas that we're adding to entries are always positive. Um, and the type of query we want to answer is that given an entry i of the vector, we want to give an approximation of the i entry of the vector. So here's how the count min sketch works. Uh, first, 
will partition all the n coordinates of the vector into a constant k number of buckets. Here, epsilon is like some error parameter. You should think of it as a small constant. So I'll partition the coordinates into a small number of buckets using a pairwise independent hash function. And then we'll just maintain for each bucket the sum of all the entries of the vector that hash to that bucket. So very simple. So this is, this is one count main sketch. And then we're going to repeat this t, which will be like log n times independently. So you have log n independent copies of a constant number of buckets that we're hashing entries of the vector to. That's the, that's the count min sketch. Uh, so why is this useful for answering queries? Well, so let's say we're given a query i and it hashes to the bucket b. So we know for sure that the sum of the s sub b is at least the ith entry of the vector, just because the, the sum is that vec entry of the vector plus a bunch of other things. Uh, and meanwhile, you can show that, that entry, the, the hash, the, the number in the bucket will be at most that entry of the vector plus epsilon times the L1 norm of the vector with, with constant probability. It's just, this is about what the expected value is and then you use like Markov inequality. And so if you repeat these log n times and take the minimum of all the different estimates they would give, then with high probability, uh, the estimate you output at the end is close in L1 norm to the actual entry of the vector. So that's, that's the count min sketch. And uh, you know, since we're just repeating log n times something with a constant number of buckets, uh, like the space and the update time and the query time are all just like order log n. That's very nice and efficient. All right, so let me give you another example. These two are like sort of the most famous example turnstile streaming algorithms. This is the count sketch. Uh, I, think, I think these guys were at Google when they came up with the count sketch. Uh, okay, so we're, we're again going to retain we're going to answer point queries, uh, but now we're going to aim for a different type of approximation where we want uh, error in terms of the L2 norm of the vector instead of the L1 norm. So it's a bit more strict condition of the error we want. Okay, so here's how the count sketch works. And it'll, it'll look very similar to the count min sketch. So first we're going to partition our n coordinates of the vector into two buckets called minus one and one using a pairwise independent hash function. And then we'll just maintain one sum, which is the sum of the minus one or one times that entry of the vector. And again, we'll repeat log n times independently. So why is this useful? Well, first, so if, if some entry i hashes to bucket b, then the expected value of b times the sum we're maintaining is exactly equal to v sub i, because it'll we'll always count v sub i positively in the sum, and the rest of them are like times minus one or one at random, so their expected value is zero. Uh, so in particular, and I'm, I'm skipping some details here, you can show that actually the sum will be v sub i plus or minus epsilon times the L2 norm with, with some constant probability. And again, and then if you take the median of all the log n independent ones, it'll, it'll give a good estimate to that entry of the vector with good probability. And once again, every, the space and update time and query time are all log n. Okay, that's the count sketch. Uh, so. Yeah, so the count min sketch and the count sketch that I just showed you and uh, many other similar sketches like this for turnstile streams, they all use log n space and update time to get like inverse polynomial failure probability. And you might ask like whether it's possible to improve these things. So it's actually known that log n space is necessary. We can't improve that anymore. Uh, but the question we address in this paper is whether we can improve the update time. and. I think in, in this model, really the update time is, is like the most important thing to be optimizing for. So uh, once, once you get down to an amount of space that you're happy with, that you can store on your computer or whatever, uh, then you, you normally imagine you're getting a stream of lots and lots and lots of updates that you have to handle. And you, you're usually only answering queries like once in a while about the, the vector you're maintaining. But if you have lots and lots of updates coming, then uh, you need to be able to handle the updates as quickly as they're coming. So if your update time is too slow, your whole system might fail. But if the query time is slow, maybe you just can't ask queries as often, but at least the whole system will work and still be updating correctly. So, you, and so usually the update time is really the most important thing to be optimizing for. Um, and as you probably can guess from the title of my talk, the, our answer is that yes, we can improve the update time. So, yeah. Is it... Uh... 
easy to improve the update time if I give you more space? Is that problem easy? Like the oh. moving away from the lower bounds, I allow you to have more space? Uh, definitely if you use a lot more space if it's possible. Like if, if you just store the entire vector, for example, okay. then you can have a lot of space sure. and cost of time. But say polylog is not, say, uh, it's not a good exercise. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do it at least. And is it easy, easy to do vector amortized? Uh, n no, it's not. Yeah, ours, ours will. This will also be the first thing that improves amortized, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah. So let me tell you about our result. So what we do is, we give a new generic way to maintain. Uh, so-called linear sketches, like the count sketch and the count min sketch are examples, faster. Um, so our, our new update algorithm uh, can, can quickly, implicitly maintain any sketch that's of this form, where you first partition all the coordinates of your vector into a, some number k of buckets using a c-wise independent hash function for some constant c, and then you maintain for each bucket the sum of the entries that hash to that bucket, and then you repeat some number t of times independently. So for any any sketch like this, we show how to maintain it faster. And in fact, almost every known out turnstile streaming algorithm with a few just really weird examples are actually of this form, even with k, the number of buckets being a constant, and t, the number of times you independently repeat, is log n. Like you'll probably recall, the count and count may sketch were of that form. So. Uh, so I'll focus today on those settings, but uh, for other settings, we have to also get an improved update time. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you're fixing epsilon to be a constant everywhere, and you're not going to worry about the dependence on epsilon. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Uh, but um, yeah, but if epsilon is not a constant, as long as it's not too too tiny, uh, it'll usually give like a super constant number of buckets, and then the same types of results will hold just the expression you get is a bit messier, so I'm not going to put it on the slide for today. Yeah. Are, are optimal results known, the lower bounds and upper bounds, in terms of epsilon? Uh, the, the upper bound, so the, the lower bound is, I think the lower bound might only be for constant epsilon. I'm, I don't, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I think the lower bound is only for constant epsilon. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if there are candidate examples, but in the second step, does it actually apply to any? Would it, would it apply to any function, any linear function of the VIs? Not just a sum. Oh, it, so it, it has. Uh, so the, so it, as long as the sketch is maintaining like sums, and then the query somehow only uses the sums of what goes into the buckets, then it'll apply. But we we really use the fact that it's it's sums it's not, that are using. Not linear function. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. Uh, linear sketch. Okay. It's usually called. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's more specifically what we show. Um, and here I'll just in a lot of slides I'll just keep in the blue box like a reminder of the, what the sketch we're maintaining is. This is the same thing I just said. Uh, so we implicitly maintain any such sketch, still using the same amount of space, just log in words of space, with uh, so in the RAM model. Worst case update time log to the 0.582n. Uh, so this should be compared to log n, which was the update time of what I told you before. And then in addition, we have an extra, an additive extra query time of log to the 1.582n, where this number 0.582 is, oh, it's kind of covered here. So it's, it's like two thirds omega minus one, where omega is the matrix multiplication exponent. So it's the smallest roughly the smallest number such that you can multiply d by d matrices in d to the omega at time. Um, so yeah, so to be clear here, we're not like, this is not like some new type of sketch that we need some new analysis to prove it's correct or something. We're really like implicitly maintaining exactly the same count sketch or count min sketch or whatever as before. And then whenever you get an update, you just spend this much worst case time to update our implicit maintained version of the sketch. And whenever you get a query, you spend this much additive time to recover exactly what the count min sketch or the count sketch or whatever is supposed to look like at this time. And then you can do, you know, whatever you were doing before to answer queries on this count min sketch, say that we've exactly reconstructed again. 
So we're really maintaining exactly the same thing as before, but with faster worst case update time. Um, okay, so I mentioned the. Oh, yeah. Quick question. Um, you, in number three, you say you, re you repeat this O of log n times independently. Does that automatically require O of log n update time, or does that not factor into the update time somehow? Yeah, so we, we, we've managed to like maintain these log n independent things, but using faster than log n update times. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll probably become more clear okay. soon, I guess. Okay. Yeah, so I think it, it is kind of surprising, maybe. Uh, okay. So, so okay. So I, I mentioned that usually the update time is, is sort of more important than the query time, but maybe uh, you're someone who, who really cares a lot about the query time. And you'll remember like in the algorithms, the count sketch and the countman sketch I told you about before, the query time was only log n. And, and so this would actually increase like a maybe substantial amount what the query time is. So, so first I'll say there are actually a number of other other types of queries where the best known, even though the best known update time was log n before, the query time is way bigger than this, and this actually just doesn't hurt the query at all. But like, for example, for the point queries, this does increase the query time. So we also give another result where we get down to additive extra query time, like basically just log n. So we, we essentially don't increase the query time, and in exchange, the update time is, is not as good, but still better than log n. So there's some trade-off between the update time you get and the additive extra query time, depending on like how often you want to be doing queries. Can you, uh, uh, sorry, can I create a sketch, then fix the stream and say it never comes, changes ever again, and then change my data structure so that I can do faster query time after the fact? Is it, in, in other words, is this sort of like query time at any time that your stream is coming through, or is it only at the end? Uh, oh, oh, of course, it's, Oh, it's it's every every time you if oh like if you want to do many queries at the same time or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so if you if you want to do a bunch of queries at the same time, it's you do this once and then you can answer all the queries. So it's you just you, you sort of need to pay this again okay, this if there have been good. updates since your last query. But that's the trans that's like the transformation step. Yeah, yeah. This is this is it's literally just re this much time to reconstruct exactly what the say the count main sketch looks like right now. And then you can do as many queries as you want to it. Yeah. Um, and those queries are log in. Yeah. Good. Uh, mo uh, okay, I don't know about, it depends on, like some queries actually take like like polynomial and in time. It depends on what query you want and how complicated it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so in addition to this, we have we have one more result and it's, it's in a little bit of a different model from the RAM model that we get an even faster update time and query time. So let me go to another slide where I'll tell you what this model is, and then I'll come back to this result slide again to talk more about it. What's alpha name? Oh, oh alpha is the, it's like the dual exponent of matrix multiplication. So it's, it's, the, it's the biggest number such that you can multiply an n by n to the alpha matrix with an n to the alpha by n matrix in roughly n squared time. Yeah, uh, it's our best bound out is about 0.3 right now. Okay. Okay. So let me yeah let me tell you about this model. Uh, so here's here's what I how I, what I said about the RAM model before. Uh, you know we have these standard opera word operations we define that if you do them on a constant number of words it takes constant time. Um, so I want to define a, a new variant on the word RAM model. They'll they'll call it the word RAM with matrix multiplication model, and it's exactly the same as the RAM model we've been talking about but where there's one more operation that we also call standard, which is multiplying to square root of W by square root of W matrices. So in other words, multiplying two matrices that each fit into a single word. Well, we're like furthermore saying you can do that in constant time. So this is, okay, this is of course not usually a standard operation. And as far as I know, I think watching and I like just made up this model for this paper. But let me briefly try to argue that this is not totally unreasonable. So yes, yeah, so, so probably maybe probably you guys know even better than me about this. But often people have nice graphics cards in their computer that are really optimized at multiplying small matrices with each other so that they can do it quickly in graphics processing that they want to do. So if, if you have a computer with a graphics card that 
you know, to multiply matrices very quickly, it might actually be reasonable to use this model to model your computer instead of the usual word ram model. And similarly, if, if you have an application where you really want to be able to handle stream updates very quickly, you could imagine uh, even constructing nice hardware that's good at multiplying really small matrices for this type of task. Okay, so that's the word ram with matrix multiplication model. Um, but from yeah, I guess as a, as a theorist, as, as someone who's interested in like lower bounds for things like streaming algorithms, I think this model is also interesting because of its relationship with another model called the cell probe model. So this is another model for something like streaming algorithms, where it's, a, it's like a very strong model where you're only charged time for accessing words of memory. And like any computation you do on the words of memory you've looked at is free. So this is this is. This is a nice model for proving lower bounds in usually because like it's it's like stronger than any other reasonable model you might ever come up with. And so if you prove a lower bound here, then you're happy that uh, it should give a lower bound in any other reasonable model. That's the idea. And in particular, it's even stronger than the like the word RAM model in which you call any possible operation on a constant number of words standard. And it's even stronger than this. So our word RAM with matrix mult upper bound that I'll tell you about in a second actually also gives a cell pro model upper bound, which I'll compare to a lower bound. Okay, so, so let me go back to the, to the result now. Uh, yeah, so here's what we get in this word RAM with matrix multi model. We get down to really small update time, like log to the 0.2 n. Um, so, so yeah, first of all, this is much faster if you really do have hardware that can do this kind of thing. Uh, and then second of all, uh, I think it's really interesting compared to a recent lower bound. So in 2015, Larson, Nelson, and Nguyen showed that uh, square root of log n update time lower bound for lots of the problems that are solved, like with count sketch and map count min sketch. They proved it in the cell pro model that I was just talking about, but they proved it against non-adaptive algorithms. So by that, I mean an algorithm that sort of when you get each update, what you do only depends on the current update and not like previous updates you've had in the past. So like the, in particular, the cells of memory you look at depend only on your current update and not the past history of the algorithm. And uh, so prior to this work, all the known, like essentially all the known turnstile streaming algorithms were non-adaptive. So this was like a lower bound against the approaches that we knew before for making turnstile streams. Uh, but of course, we get around this lower bound in this model, which is weaker than the cell probe model. We get better than square root of log n update time. And the, the way we're able to do that is that our algorithm actually is going to be adaptive. So what we do for a particular update also will depend on what happened in some previous updates. Yeah. Do, do you lose any sort of like added benefit of non-adaptivity that so like those are usually like mergeable or so you can write on like many computers differently. They send in the sketches, you edit that together and then you have everything as if as if everything happened on a single computer. So yeah, yeah. Does this thing impact it in the uh, a, a little bit, but not not too much. Like the thing where it maintain it's sort of uh, every every so often it's linear again, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like you can't you can't split up the the updates in as fine green the way as you usually can, but you still can split them up in like groups of log n basically. So like with a little bit of extra work basically you get the same. Yeah, exactly. So you lose a little bit of what strictly you speaking not, but essentially yes. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Uh, yeah. And actually the 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 way this this whole project started is we actually were trying to take this lower bound and extend it to adaptive algorithms also. And we weren't able to prove that and, and sort of our, our new algorithms explain why. So I think it's a nice example of uh, like trying to prove lower bounds actually lead, leading to interesting new algorithms. OK. Um, yeah, are there any more questions about the results? OK, so in the rest of the time, I want to tell you how this algorithm works. And I'm, I'm going to focus on this top one, the RAM model, the best update time we can get to. Uh, but like the algorithms are really almost exactly the same as each other. So we'll see, we'll see at the end like where they differ. Um, so here is here's our plan. And again, here's the type of sketch we're trying to maintain. So it's it's three main steps. In the so in the first step, 
what I'm going to give you is a generic reduction from worst case update time, which we're trying to achieve, to handling a batch of updates. So I'll show that if there's a nice way to handle a batch of updates this, of this form quickly, then we can actually get a nice, fast, worst case update time out of it. So that'll be the first step. And then after that, we'll, so we'll have to handle a batch of updates. And the second part, I'll show how to reduce from a batch of updates of this form to fast matrix multiplication. And then in the third part, I'll talk about how to do fast matrix multiplication quickly. And this is sort of where the heavy lifting is going to come. Um, and okay, I wanna, yeah, so one thing before I start, the, the algorithm sort of, you know, there's these three parts and each of them has some subparts and pretty much every slide of the algorithm I'm going to present is like conceptually completely independent of every other slide. We sort of combine a bunch of different ideas all together. So if we're on one slide and you kind of get lost or confused or zone out for a little bit, you should be able to start paying attention again on like the next slide or the next step in it, and hopefully you'll be able to follow again. Are they pairwise independent? Uh, yeah, they're, they're totally independent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess the first step doesn't use the linearity of the sketch. Yeah, the first, the first step is, is just the thing about streams in general. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And then the second and third are really using the structure. Of this. Okay, so let's, let's go. Uh, yeah, and there, yeah, so there's sort of lots of different types of techniques we're going to use, and I, I think a lot of them are pretty exciting, so hopefully you'll agree. Okay, so let's start with the first step, a generic up reduction from worst case update time to handling a batch of updates. So here is here's the, the lemma about this that we proved. So if you're working in the RAM model, and you have two numbers, M and S, where M is the M is like the number of updates you're batching together, and S is the space you're using. Then, if you have an algorithm that can handle a batch of M updates in space S and time T, then from that you get an algorithm that can handle single updates in space S and worst case time T divided by M, so one mth of the total time, with an additive T extra query time. This is our lemma. So, okay, if I had said amortize there instead of worst case, this is, this is pretty easy to see that it's true. You just, uh, you take the M updates, you don't do anything, and then once you have all M at once, you just run this and it takes T time. But in fact, and it's not even that much more complicated than what I just said, you can see that you can even get worst case there instead of amortized. Uh, so here's how it works. And it's, it's really probably exactly what you're all thinking it is. So we're going to maintain two buffers, like lists, lists of updates, buffer zero and buffer one, and they're each of size M, so they can each like hold M updates in them. Uh, so first, for the first M updates, we'll just put them into buffer zero and not do anything else with them until buffer zero is full. Okay, then after that, for each of the next M updates, we're gonna put them into buffer one while we simultaneously flush out buffer zero. So just for each of the updates, you'll put the update into buffer one, and then you'll take T divided by M steps of the batch update algorithm applied to the M updates we have in buffer zero. So you take T over M of the steps, and then you pause there and wait until the next update, and you get the next update, and then you pick up from where you left off and take T divided by M more of the steps, and so on. And that's the whole thing. Uh, then once you finish those M updates in buffer zero, buffer one is full, so you, but buffer zero is totally handled, so you clear that out and you switch the roles of the two buffers and you keep going. So at any time, we're sort of in the middle of doing our batch update algorithm, and our, our memory is like, the memory we have right now is sort of meaningless. It's like the state in the middle of running some algorithm. So that's why we have this extra additive T query time, because if you ever get a query, you first, just finish running the batch update on the, the current buffer that you're doing it on. So you finish that and get to the actual state of the, say the count min sketch that it's supposed to be. And then you can answer your queries on the real count min sketch. So that's why there's this added, added extra query time. Yeah, so this is somehow a pretty silly trick, but I think it's really nice. Uh, and one thing that's, uh, one thing that's a bit subtle about it is that it actually depends a fair bit on the RAM model. 
So for example, this is kind of just an aside, but you can't do the same trick in the cell probe model. And the reason is this part where you pause and pick up from that spot the next time doesn't actually work in the cell probe model. In that model, you, you have this, like, sorry, you know, in that model, every all the computation you do is free. And so to make it not trivial, you have to add in this assumption that every time you get an update, you sort of flush out all your registers and the memory you have right now, because otherwise you would just already remember everything and there'd be nothing like to do. So, uh, but because of that, if, if like in the middle of this algorithm in the cell probe model, it was storing lots of stuff, then you can't pause because when you get the new update, it flushes out everything you were thinking about before. But in the RAM model, you can do that. You can, you can just sort of write whatever you're working on to memory and then load it back in. You can even assume in the RAM model that you only have a constant number of, of registers you're working with. So you won't, there are only like constants involved in doing this. Anyway, that's a little bit subtle, but the, the idea is it's actually to get from like amortized time to worst case of time. It's actually just this kind of silly trick. Okay. Uh, yeah, any questions about that? Okay. So, so let's get into the, oh yeah. So this is the one way proof. And now, now we wanna apply it to our, our type of linear sketch. And we're gonna, we're gonna end up picking M and S to be like log N so that oh, like we, we, don't, we won't, don't wanna increase the space we're using. So we'll pick S to be log N and then we'll make M as big as possible. So we'll also pick log N, log N rather. So our goal is to handle log N updates in space log N and time log to the 1.582n. Okay, so let's move on to step two. I'm going to reduce from this problem we're trying to do to fast matrix multiplication. All right. Uh, yeah, and it, it, you know, somehow since we're, we're maintaining some linear things, maybe it seems like intuitively like we should be able to do this, but there's actually a few very tricky details that are going to come up. All right. So here, here's what we're trying to do. So more specifically, the problem is that we're given M updates, like which is each a pair of an index and uh, an amount to change it by. And we want to, well, there's two things we need to do. First, we need to compute the hash, all the hashes we need. So for each pair of one of the T, like log N different hash functions, and one of the M, like also log N updates, we need to compute the hash of the update. And then after we've computed all those hashes, then we actually have to figure out what we're, how we're supposed to do the update. We have to compute for each hash function and each bucket it hashes to the sum of all the updates that are supposed to go into that hash bucket. So those are like the two steps. We have to compute the hashes and then actually do the update based on the hashes. Uh, yeah, and so what I'm going to do is show that each of these two steps can be like efficiently reduced to the to matrix multiplication, where we're going to log, multiply log n by log n matrices with zero one entries. Okay, so let's start with the first one, computing all the hashes. Uh, okay, and to make things easier, I'm going to start with the case when k and c are two. So k is the number of buckets, and c is the it's a c-wise independent hash function. So I'm going to start for now with a pairwise independent hash function to two buckets, and then I'll show how to generalize it to the bigger cases. Okay. So so here here is the key. What we're going to do is pick a really nice family of pairwise independent hash functions that are so that it's easy to evaluate them with matrix multiplication. So our goal is to reduce this to matrix mult. So and, but we can we can pick which pairwise independent family we want. We're going to pick one that's easy to work with matrix multiplication. So here's how it is. Prob I would guess many of you have seen this before also. <laughs> okay, so our family will work for a random seed S, which is will be a zero one string of length log n, and an input i to the hash function. So it's a hash function from n to zero one, but I'm going to think of it as a hash function from zero one to the log n to zero one. So for a seed S and an input i, our hash fun function is just going to be the inner product of the input and the seed mod two. Okay, and then why is this pairwise independent? Probably most of you know already. Uh, if you have two different inputs, i0 and i1, that means they differ in some bit L, one of the log n bits L. Uh, so when you toggle the Lth bit of the seed, exactly one of the two hash values is toggled and that, that's independent of everything else. So these two values are independent of each other. Okay, that's pairwise independent. Uh, and then how do we evaluate this hash function on all the pairs of things? Well, 
So when you're given m inputs, uh, which are zero, m different zero one strings of length log n, <coughs> and you're given t seeds, which are also strings of zero one strings of length log n, our goal is to compute the inner product between each pair of an input and a seed, and this is like exactly the definition of log n by log n matrix multiplication. So you exactly do this with matrix multiplication because we've defined it as an inner product like this. Okay. So now, now let me generalize this from pairwise independent to c-wise independent for constant c. So I'll say uh, for the count min sketch and the count sketch, they actually only need pairwise independence. So it's enough to just do this trick. But there are other examples. We like search through all of every turnstile streaming algorithm we can find. And we even found some that use up to eight wise independence. And so if you use a constant bigger than two, you'll need a more complicated trick that I'm going to say next. Uh, so here it is. So let's generalize from pairwise independence to c-wise independence for a constant c. And yeah, again, think of c as at most like eight. So yeah, again, we need a family of c-wise independent hash functions that are easy to compute with matrix multiple. And here's, here's the plan for what we're going to do. It kind of generalized the previous thing from pairwise. So first, we're going to pick a map g from our inputs. Our inputs are zero one strings of length log n to zero one strings of length c log n, such that for any c distinct inputs to the function, the vectors you get from applying g to them are linearly independent over f2. Okay? Uh, I haven't said how to do this yet, but we're, we're first going to do that. And then in the second step, It'll be just like before. We'll pick a random seed, which is a random zero one string of length C log n. And then for each input i, the hash function will be just the inner product of the seed and g of the input. So this is a generalization of what we did before for pairwise independence. There, our map g could just be like the identity map, because with the identity map for any two different inputs, uh, like any two different vectors are linearly independent from each other. So this is a generalization of that, of that for a bigger constant c. Um, and why, is, why does this work? The argument is, is very similar to what we said before. Why is this c-wise independent? Uh, yeah, so hopefully you can see this. So for any c distinct inputs, uh, you can like think about the c by c log n matrix, where you compute g of the different inputs, and you like form the matrix out of those rows. Uh, and this is, well, like by assumption, this matrix has rank C because we are assuming the rows are linearly independent. And so in particular, when you multiply by a random zero one vector to get a length C output at the end, uh, it's a uniformly random length C vector. So that means all the different hash functions, which are the outputs of this process are independent of each other. Okay, it's the, this is like the same argument as before, just with more linear algebra. Okay. Um, but what I haven't told you yet is how to do this step one, how to pick this map. And uh, so let me tell you how to do that now. And this is, this is going to be like probably far and away the most technical slide of the whole talk. Yeah, I'm calling it a, a math interlude because first of all, it's going to involve more math. And second of all, it's kind of unrelated to everything else. So if you like get lost on this slide, then really don't worry about it. Just pick up on the next slide and it'll be okay. But I think the trick, I, I was thinking of not saying this, but I think this trick is actually really cool. So I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Okay, so what we want is a map from here, W is the word size. So log n bit strings to C log n bit strings, such that for any C distinct inputs, the vectors they map to are linearly independent over F2. Okay, and secretly, we also need this map to be something we can efficiently compute over in the word RAM model. Okay, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm first going to have to tell you a little bit about the finite field of size two to the W. Okay, so maybe you're not familiar with it or maybe you're not, but let me tell you what you need to know about this finite field. So it's defined like this. You fix, first fix an irreducible degree W polynomial over F2. Uh, doesn't matter what the word irreducible means. You just fix some, some particular nice degree W polynomial over F2. And then the finite field of size two to the W is defined as all polynomials in X over F2 mod this polynomial Q. So uh, any two polynomials that you can get for between each other by adding like multiples of Q count as the same polynomial in this field. That's how it's defined. Uh, the details are not so important, but in particular, one thing is that 
elements of this finite field correspond to degree W minus one polynomials over F2. So if the, if the degree were W or bigger, you could like subtract away Q until it gets down to degree W minus one. So elements of this finite field, you can think of them as degree W minus one polynomials over the field. And in particular, we can then correspond that with the length W vector of its inputs, of its, sorry, coefficients of the polynomial. So the element, you can think of it as an element of the finite fields of size two to the W, or you can correspond it with this vector, which is a length W vector of F2 elements. Um, okay, so in, the, in, you know, in fields, you can multiply and you can add things. So multiplying with these vectors doesn't make sense, but actually addition in these two ways of thinking about it is exactly the same. So adding two polynomials is exactly over F2 is exactly the same as adding their coefficient vectors. So addition in these two different ways to think about the elements is the same thing. Okay, okay, that's what we need to know about finite fields. So here is the construction now. So here's how we're going to define this map. So we'll take in the input. It's a zero one string of length W. We'll think of it as an element of the finite field of size two to the W, and we'll map it to this vector where you take the powers of the input from the zeroth power to the C minus one power. Okay, and we're doing these powers over the finite field. This is why we do the finite field. But then you think of these as, as these vectors. So this is actually a zero one vector of length C times W. Okay, that's the map. So why does this work? Well, so we can think of this vector either as a vector over the big finite field, like it says L C elements of the big finite field, or it's like C times W elements of the small field. Okay, so over the big finite field, it's not too hard to see that if you pick any C different entries and you look at the C by C matrix of G of all those different entries, you make, so each one is a vector of length C, so you make a C by C matrix of them. This is a, this is a van der Mann matrix by how we defined it. And since the I's are all distinct, this is a full rank C by C matrix. Okay, so over F2 to the W, these rows are linearly independent from each other, which is the kind of goal we're trying to aim for. But we, we don't want to say they're linearly independent over F2 to the W, we want to say they're linearly independent over F2. But because addition over these two fields is the same thing, that also implies they're linearly independent over F2. So if we had these vectors and they were not linearly independent over F2 to, as length CW vectors, so in other words, if there's some subset of them that sums together to zero, then that same subset would also have summed to get zero over F2 to the W, which they can't because it's full rank over there. Okay, that's the trick. I think, I think it's kind of cool. You, you like work over this weird finite field, which, uh, but it still gives you nice properties over F2, which is what you actually want. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of hiding some details here, but like computing powers of things over finite field is really easy to do over the, in the RAM model. Like there are sort of other constructions of CY's independent maps that involve doing stuff that as far as I know, you can't efficiently do in the RAM model, but by doing this nice algebra trick, we actually can do it quickly in the RAM model. Okay, okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's return to our, you know, algorithms. Uh, so, so okay, so we've now computed the hashes of all the inputs. Do you, sorry, do you oh. think you're going to run out of time? Oh, how much time am I supposed to have left? Twelve minutes. Because yeah. uh, if yes, then I don't have a question. If no, I have a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess there's maybe like maybe about fifteen more minutes. Maybe okay, ten. Can I ask minutes. it offline. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we've computed the hashes of all the inputs, uh, and now, now we want to figure out how the hash buckets are supposed to update. So we have to compute for each bucket and each thing that hashed to that bucket the sum, the sum, of, the, the sum of those updates. Uh, and again, we're going to do this with matrix multiplication, and uh, here maybe it's a little bit easier to see that we should be able to do this because we're somehow computing a bunch of different linear combinations, which it feels like matrices are good at doing that. Uh, so here's, here's the idea. So first I'm going to write out this thing, all these things we want to compute as like a matrix times vector. So we can make this matrix whose rows correspond to a hash function and a hash bucket and columns correspond to inputs. And we'll put a one if that input hashed to that bucket and a zero otherwise. And then we want to multiply this matrix times the vector of the deltas. And that's, sorry, exactly 
what we want to compute is exactly computing this matrix times this vector. Um, so this is not exactly what I told you we're aiming to do. Uh, so remember, our goal is to reduce to the multiplication of two log n by log n matrices with zero one entries. And this is a log n by log n matrix with zero one entries times a vector of length log n whose entries are integers with log n bits. So it's a little bit different. But it turns out, if you replace this vector with the log n by log n matrix, whose rows are just the bits of those integers, and then you multiply these matrices, then the result is a matrix whose entries more or less correspond to the binary expansion of all the outputs of the matrix times vector. So I'm not going to you know, bore you with the details of that, but it turns out you basically can just turn it into the matrix times matrix, and it works out exactly how you think it should. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and then finally, we can move on to the last step, which is fast matrix multiplication in the RAM model. Uh, so, so we've reduced everything so far to just the following problem, which is you're given as input two matrices A and B, which are log n by log n matrices with zeros and ones, and we want to compute their product, and we're hoping to do it in time log to the 1.582n. Okay, so norm normally, you know, in most like algorithms talks I see that involve matrix multiplication, you kind of just use fast matrix multiplication as like a black box. Like you just know D by D matrices can be multiplied in D to the omega time. You just plug that into whatever you're doing. But actually in this situation, doing that or the most straightforward things are not going to give us a fast enough result that we want. So, you know, the, if you just plug this, if you just plug this into a fast matrix multiplication algorithm, you would get running time log n, the dimension to the omega, which is like log n to the 2.373, which is slower than we're hoping for. Uh, so there's another thing you might try to do, because we're working in the RAM model, you can try to do like RAM bit tricks. So uh, one thing you can, you can see, and I'll, I'll show you this in a second, is that in the RAM model, actually if you have two vectors that each fit into a word, you can compute their inner product in nearly constant time. So, uh, so like our goal is to compute n, uh, sorry, log n squared different inner products of vectors like this. So you could do that for each of the entries, and that would give you log squared n time, which is faster, but still slower than what we're aiming for. Uh, so the way we're going to get our algorithm is actually to combine these two approaches in some way. So we need to be more clever than just doing the straightforward things, and we're somehow going to combine the two ideas. And it, it, I think it's kind of interesting because you know, if you're working with very small, very small matrices smaller than this, then like only bit tricks suffice to get the fastest algorithm. And you're, if you're working with very big matrices like poly and n-dimensional matrices, then just using fast matrix multi like gives you the best you could hope for up to like small log factors that are not substantial there. But here we're in a very like we're in like an intermediate regime where we want to multiply matrices that are polynomial in the word size. And it turns out the fastest way to do this actually combines both of these approaches. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so I first want to tell you about the bit tricks we want to do in the RAM model. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, I tried, I think me explaining this on the board is going to be easier for everyone to understand than the PowerPoint animations I was trying to make. So I'm going to, I'll do this very quickly because it's kind of, uh, it's, it's sort of, sort of known from past work already. It's not, it's not, oh, very fancy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let, let me let me tell you what we're going to do. So let me first tell you about the the thing from before that you can multiply, you can compute the inner product of two vectors which each fit into a word. So here's, here's the following. This looks given. inverted. Yeah, no, no. but the recording is right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're given two vectors, a1, a2, up to a l which is a vector in F2 to the L. And we're given another vector, B1, B2, BL, which is also there. And we want to compute their inner product. Uh, so what we're going to do is just move around these bits so that they fit into integers, like numbers of length about L. And so that when we then multiply those numbers as numbers, uh, we'll be able to read out the inner product from some of the bits of their multiplication as numbers. Okay, and here's how we'll do it. We're, first, we're basically just going to space out the entries of these vectors. So we'll first convert A into a vector that looks like A1, then a bunch of zeros of some length G, 
then A2, then a bunch of zeros of some like G, then A3, then a bunch of zeros, and so on, up to AL. And we'll do the same thing for B, but we'll do it in the opposite order. So we'll have BL, then a bunch of zeros, then BL minus one, then a bunch of zeros, and so on, and then B1. Okay, and I'll pick the gap length to be something like log L. Okay, so we're, I'm going up the length by about log L factor. Uh, so what happens when you multiply these things together? Well, we're going to get, so... L log L. Yeah, the... the You're blowing up by L. Uh, yeah, the, the length before was L and the new length is L log L. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what happens when we multiply the things together? Basically, the, these gaps are big enough so that we'll, we'll get a sum of a bunch of different things corresponding to how many gaps in the A's and B's we've taken together. So the, the very rightmost thing we'll get is going to be just AL times B1, because every, like the first G bits of the output, because everything else has at least zero G's pushing it to the left, and it'll be, sorry, G zeros pushing it to the left, and it'll be too far to the left. Then the next thing we'll, we'll get will be like the thing with maybe zeros here in the B string, but none in the A, or zeros in the A string, but none in the B. So it'll be like AL times B2 plus AL minus one times B1, and so on. Each time we, when we take the third one, it'll be the sum of these three things, and we take the fourth one, it'll be the sum of these four things, and so on. Because each time you need another group of zeros to move you to that next bucket. And in particular, yeah, it'll go on for a while. And in particular, when you look at the bucket right in the middle, it's exactly going to be like the sum of all those products, which is exactly the inner product of these two vectors. So you rearrange them like this, and the product as numbers gives you the inner product of these vectors, which is what we're hoping for. Okay, now we can also do this for matrices, and it turns out you can get the result that I wrote on the slide over there. I don't know if the remote people can see it, but it turns out you can do tricks like this to also multiply log to the one-third by log to the one-third matrices in roughly constant time in the RAM model. And I'm not, I'm not going to write more things on the board to show you how to do it, but it's basically the, the exact same thing. So we have these gadgets for turning vectors into numbers so that when you multiply them, you can read out the inner product. Then we'll just make a gadget for each row of the first matrix and a gadget for each column of the second matrix and space out those gadgets so that when you multiply those as numbers, uh, you can like read all the products of the gadgets and then recover all of their inner products. And so we can only get to log to the one third by log to the one third because in these gadgets here, we have our actual answer we care about in the middle, but then lots of junk to either side of it that we, we don't like we're computing, but we don't care about. And that's still not going to take up space in the, in the product of these smaller matrices. Yeah, so that's the idea. I can tell you more detail later if you're interested in that. Uh, yeah, okay, so now I will return to my slides. So, so, this, so this is what we get. You can multiply these matrices in nearly constant time in the RAM model. And now, finally, we need one more thing, which is I have to tell you a tiny bit about how fast matrix multiplication algorithms work. Uh, and I'm really going to tell you just one thing about them, which is a really nice fact from like arithmetic complexity, which is that you can assume without loss of generality that fast matrix multiplication algorithms are recursive algorithms. Okay, so let me let me be a bit more clear about what I mean by that. So all they all have recursive structure without loss of generality. So let me remind you a little bit about how Strassen's algorithm works. Hopefully, many of you have seen it before. But in Strassen's algorithm, it has the following form. So you're trying to multiply two d by d matrices A and B. And you first, according to some clever identities that Strassen came up with, you compute seven different d over two by d over two matrices for A and seven different D over two by D over two matrices for B. And you can do this in D squared time. And then you multiply all the pairs of them. So we've reduced, we've like recursed down to seven different multiplications of D over two by D over two matrices. And then finally, you recombine those in some way to compute our final product. So that's how Strassen's algorithm works. And uh, from it, you get this recursion that you do seven different multiplications of D over two matrices plus some time for some linear combinations. And you get that uh, final running time of d to the log base two of seven. Um, so it turns out, without loss of generality, any matrix multiplication algorithm has this form, just with 
two and seven replaced with way huger constants. So like Strassen's algorithms of this form, the copper smith Winograd algorithms of this form. If someone in this room comes up with a faster matrix multi algorithm tomorrow, I can even, like, without general, loss of generality, put that algorithm into this form too. So all matrix multi algorithms can be made recursive like this. So that's, that's all we need to know. And so finally, here's how we'll compute, combine our different things together. We're going to take our input matrix, recurse down to log to the one third by log to the one third matrices, and then use our matrix to multiply those in constant time. Uh, yeah, so, okay, I'll try to be quick. So given one instance of log n by log n matrix multiplication, uh, you first take two thirds of the numbers of, of recursive steps as you normally would to get down to log to the two thirds omega and instances of log to the one third by log to the one third matrix multiplication. And then rather than recursing further, you then use our bit trips tricks to solve each of those in constant time. And so the running time you get is log to the 1.582n, which is what I promised at the beginning. Okay, yeah, so that's that's the whole algorithm. And just here's the same results slide from before to just remind you of the whole statement of the results. Uh, 